sure you probably have heard this from parents or others, but one of the wonderful things about the experience you're going through now in college and, and those of you who will go on to graduate school is that you're making relationships, you're forming relationships with people who will be lifelong friends. And it's remarkable, really, uh, that these relationships are as enduring as they are. And you will find that you'll go for years, maybe even decades, not seeing somebody. Uh, uh, and then you'll be reunited in some uh, fashion, and you'll pick up right where you left off. Such is the case with uh, Conan Graves and my uh, friendship with Conan. We overlapped briefly uh, in graduate school at Harvard when Conan was finishing his law degree, 1974-75. That was the year I arrived to work on my PhD. Uh, the next time I ran into Conan was in Japan, almost a decade later, when I was doing some research at the Harvard Business School. And he was there for Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, serving as an uh, international uh, lawyer and doing some amazing things. And I happened to run into him one day on a Sunday at church. And he and his wife, uh, Cindy, graciously invited me to come spend the afternoon and have uh, dinner with them at their lovely home uh, in Tokyo. And that was at a time and in a day when uh, I can tell you that uh, the place that they were living in Tokyo was, uh, was frankly simply amazing. Uh, and I was sort of blown away by how, uh, how well situated uh, Conan and his family were, but more importantly about the graciousness and kindness that they extended to me during the time I was there. It was my first trip to Japan. Uh, I was uh, seeing many new things for the first time. I've since uh, uh, run into Conan one or two more times, once in uh, the course of my career as a, as a consultant, uh, doing executive education programs for leading companies, and he was still at Bristol Myers Squibb at that time. Uh, and this would have been back in, in New Jersey, uh, near Princeton. Uh, and then, uh, not long ago, uh, a couple of years ago, when the tsunami hit in Japan, I was reading in the newspaper that Conan and his wife, Cindy, who had served in Japan uh, as mission presidents in the Sendai area, which is where the, one of some of the most uh, devastation occurred. Uh, they were back in Japan serving in another role uh, in public relations. Uh, and it was wonderful to hear of the kind of service that they were, were giving. Uh, it's no doubt in my mind that Conan is one of America's greatest authorities on Japan. Uh, and I am sure that were there native Japanese speakers here in the audience, they could attest to the fluency of his language. You know, the Japanese, like some other uh, cultures, uh, are sometimes a little off, put off by people who can speak Japanese as fluently as they can. Gaijins that can speak the language as fluently as they can because they literally forget that they are non-Japanese speakers. And having penetrated that veil, uh, it causes a little bit of insecurity uh, on their part. Uh, we have today an extraordinary uh, individual in Conor Grange. You're going to enjoy uh, learning from him about his uh, career and, uh, and his insights from the pharmaceutical industry, I hope we'll also uh, hear about uh, a lot about Japan too. So if you will, please join me in welcoming Conor Grips. Thank you, uh, Dean Anderson. Put this on, working all right? I don't know what we had for dinner on that Sunday, but if this is my payback for it, it must not have been that great. <laughs> so anyway, it's really a delight to be here with you today. I love to be on campus. I love to be with students. And uh, 
again, uh, he talked about uh, our situation, how well situated we were in Tokyo at that time. Uh, that was probably the nicest situated we ever were. It has been all downhill uh, both before and since that time. But uh, I like the story by Mark Twain who uh, said that the um, measure of a man's success in life is not by how much money he made, but how many stories he has to tell at the end of it. And uh, so I hope I have stories, and I hope uh, to share some of those with you today, and hopefully you'll be able to pick up uh, some lessons from those uh, stories and maybe some insights about uh, careers in business and specifically uh, international business. So uh, I'm convinced that uh, Beyonce must be somewhere on campus today. Uh, the power's gone out uh, like, the <laughs> like it did at the Super Bowl. So, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, being here today. If we don't make it through the power today, we'll, uh, we'll just be in the dark, but... Uh, Looking forward to it. Now, I have to tell you that uh, I am, in fact, a, a Utah State graduate. There I am, three years of age, <laughs> right there. And uh, my dad was a Utah State graduate, and uh, I was two to three years old when we were there. And we lived, this was married student housing, Quonset Hut, uninsulated, <laughs> Quonset Hut. And uh, that's the deep snow, which I'm sure still comes today. But uh, so that was, uh, I have some memories of that. I remember, actually, I do remember this particular scene, and maybe because I've seen it a few times since that time. But anyway, we go back. I was an Aggie back in the old days. So, okay, well, um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about, in the beginning, about uh, international business careers. And I hope that some of you are interested in that. Maybe I'm going to stand over here so I can just see these notes a little bit better. I don't want to walk in front of the screen, but uh, I've uh, learned over the years um, uh, what I think are the keys to being in international business, maybe from a lawyer's perspective, but I think it's true with, uh, with no matter uh, what field you're in. And I've come to call this the uh, three-dimensional uh, matrix of international business. And those are you know, foreign language and culture, whether you have some foreign experience, speak a language. Uh, whether you have some kind of substantive discipline, uh, law, accounting, finance, or so forth. In the case of uh, law, in my case, uh, there's all kinds of lawyers. There's litigators and tax lawyers and uh, mergers and acquisition lawyers, and those are all different disciplines which you uh, need to specialize in. And we're in more and more in an er era of specialization. And then the final uh, one is an industry specialty. You know, what do you know about pharmaceuticals or the car industry or so on and so forth? Uh, maybe I'll just uh, ask right here, out of these uh, three things, what you think is the most important when it comes to getting a job? How many think language and culture? Okay. How many think your specialization, your substantive specialization? Okay. How many of you think it's your knowledge of an industry? Okay. It's the last. The employer really wants to know, how much do you know about me and my industry? That's really the most important thing to them. Now, when you graduate, you're probably not going to know that much about any particular industry because you're here at school. And that's something that comes uh, later in your career. But as you develop your career over time, keep this in mind. You have to be very good substantively, whether you're going to be an accountant or finance or whatever you do. Um, but you need to know the person's industry, and then your cultural experience is like the, uh, the icing on the cake. And I'll hopefully you'll see some uh, examples of that as we, as we go through. Um, so what does it mean? What are you going to have to do if you want an international career? Um, you know, there's foreign experience. Uh, is it necessary? Uh, it helps. It's not critical. If you haven't lived overseas, don't speak a language. It doesn't uh, close you out, but it, it can certainly be helpful. There's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, Dean Anderson didn't see the house we lived in uh, when I was a, uh, in a law firm over there before I got with this nice big pharmaceutical company that took better care of me. But suffice it to say, <laughs> it's lucky I'm still married because <laughs> it was tough. It was tough on my wife who was home. I was at the office. You know, not a big deal for me, but it was tough for her and the kids to be in this little tiny uh, house that we lived in when we first uh, got over there. Um, and then, you know, it takes a real spirit, a spirit of adventure. And uh, that's uh, probably the biggest thing. And uh, I was talking to, I think, Kim upstairs today the, in the dean's office up there. And I said, uh, you know, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it again. There was a lot of sacrifices and a lot of tears. But it was a really uh, a great experience. Now... Just to sort of give you a personal example about this, when I um, first got my job out of law school, 
Um, and I uh, went to, you know, joined Baker and McKenzie, went over uh, as a lawyer, and I'd been there for several years. And this, these were the dark days, this one we weren't making any money. Uh, long story about that, but just suffice it to say, I was treated like a local employee, and they just, I was, so we didn't have money to travel home for home leave and school and so forth. But anyway, uh, along the lines came Bristol Myers Squibb, and uh, they were looking for an American lawyer with five to seven years of legal experience who was fluent in Japanese. Now in those days, and this is back in 1982, you could probably count the number of people who could do that on one hand or less. They just weren't there. So uh, it, it was my Japanese experience really that made the difference between me and all the other five to seven year lawyers that were in America at that time. So that made a difference. Now towards the end of my career, when I went to work for the Pharmaceutical Industry Association, Pharma, in Washington, D.C., by this time, I'd had 17 years pharmaceutical industry experience with Bristol Myers Squibb. And uh, when I was uh, interviewed for the job at, at, uh, at Pharma, um, there were 250 applicants for this job. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to get this job because, one, I'm too old. I was, you know, old at the time. I'm older now, but I was old at the time. And I thought, no, this, I'm too old. They're not going to want me. And I'm an international guy. I'm a Japan specialist, international guy all my career. And this is the U.S. Pharmaceutical Association. Uh, so, uh, and I, but I had good industry experience. And that was really very important, good industry experience. I'd been in a company. Most of these guys were coming out of law firms. The end of the day, when they hired me, and I said, you know, why did you hire me? This was really, it was really a surprise to me to say, they said, well, you were old and you had Japanese experience. The two things I thought would disqualify me actually qualified me because I had the experience. They wanted sort of the gray hair experience. And uh, the thing that set me apart from all the other candidates was my Japan experience. Japan's the second largest pharmaceutical market in the world, and they wanted somebody who could relate to that, you know, along with everything else. So that's just some, uh, some personal things there. Let's see. Okay, let's move down just a little bit then into... Uh, uh, I think one of the major topics for today, and that's just some of the ethical challenges of, of business, and I'm going to use the pharmaceutical industry uh, as my example here. Uh, you can sort of look at this list, and we won't go through it, but there's a variety of unethical, illegal things that you can do in any, any industry, and these are the ones that uh, come up most often uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Let me just focus on uh, two of these for a minute, just to give you some illustrations. Um, under the False Claims Act, uh, the United States, uh, there have been over the years, uh, as you can see up here, $30 billion in fines over the last 10 years against the pharmaceutical industry for violation of the False Claims Act. Uh, and those violations come in basically uh, two areas, off-label promotion, uh, which is a term of art in the industry. It basically means that, for example, if, uh, if I, Bristol Myers, have a cancer drug that is approved for breast cancer, and then I'm a pharmaceutical representative, and I go into the doctor's office and say, oh, this drug uh, is approved for uh, breast cancer, but it also works in lung cancer, but it hasn't been approved for lung cancer. That's an off-label promotion, and it's illegal to do that. It happens a lot in the industry. It shouldn't happen, but it ha does happen a lot because it expands sales, and, and, and it usually happens because there's clinical experience that indicates that, in fact, this drug does work in lung cancer, uh, uh, cancer, but it hasn't been approved by the FDA yet. So that's one of the things that happens a lot. And the other one is simply put bribing doctors or hospitals to buy your drug. Uh, we talk about that for a long time and how that happens, but uh, suffice it to say that there's been a lot of uh, uh, penalties against the industry. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's just see. There's, here's uh, uh, Senator ha uh, Waxman, who's the father of the foreign... Uh, the False Claims Act. Uh, he's not very popular in the industry, suffice it to say, but he uh, authored, authored this act, and it is as long as he's alive, this is just not going to change in any way, uh, which is a good thing. We need to have uh, keep the industry uh, honest, but just to give you some examples of, uh, of some of the recent uh, penalties, well, actually 10 years worth of penalties, this kind of shows you what's gone on there. It really pretty much affects everybody. I, you'll see that, uh, that Bristol-Myers uh, there's been no big penalties. That's because I worked there. 
<laughs> I'm happy to say. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. There probably have been some, but, uh, but it was all since I left. There's nothing happened while I was there. So, all right, let's see. Um, and then here's just a couple examples that you would know. Zocor, Zocor Viox. Again, this is pretty much uh, probably uh, off-label promotion things. But uh, let me talk just for a second about... Uh, just to give you an example of, of sort of what happens here. The False Claim Act uh, provides that if you uh, make a violation, one of the things we talked about, off-label promotion, bribery, and so forth, against the federal government, then there are two basic penalties. One is the dollar penalty, uh, the fines, and the second one would be that you're delisted from selling your product to any government agency, Medicare, Medicaid, and 50% of the sales of pharmaceuticals in this country go through the government, Medicare, Medicaid, state programs, and so forth. So um, the, when these claims are brought, and they're usually brought by a whistleblower who in the company uh, blows, you know, blows the whistle on the violations, and the False Claim Act provides that, that a whistleblower can collect 30% of whatever the government collects, whatever the fine is. So uh, if billion dollar fine, 30%, I can't even conceive of that number. You business accountants can maybe do that, but it's huge. So you get a lot of whistleblowing, and of course, that is promoted by the law firms who know about this. So the law firms are out there trying to stir up the employees saying, hey, what can you tell me about your company and what they've done? And uh, so when these cases are brought, uh, because the penalty is not the money so much, but because delisting, is such an enormous penalty, the companies basically cave in and settle these cases. And uh, one of the biggest ones, the biggest one for a long time was, was, the, was an Abbott Takeda, Japanese company, joint venture, billion dollar fine, $950 million for off-label promotion stuff, basically. And at the same time they brought the case against the company, they brought criminal penalties against 10 of em em employees and doctors. Uh, the company settled, dropped out of the case, and then the case continued on again with these employees, and, uh, and they did not settle or drop out. These were criminal penalties against these employees, and uh, one of the employees did settle, um, and the other nine were all acquitted. So the people who were charged with the violations that got the company in trouble in the first place, when they took the case to the end, they were all innocent, which means the violations really didn't occur. But the company itself had to pay the fine because they could not afford not to pay that fine on the risk that they might be delisted out of the... So that's just, you can see kind of the dilemma there and, and some of the... I just use this as an example to kind of let, give you a flavor of some of the balancing acts that go on. And, and as a lawyer, my job is to keep the company honest and within the law, but sometimes the reach of the law makes it so difficult that it becomes uh, quite a challenge. All right. Well, um, one of the cases I had was actually to go to the Supreme Court. I was the uh, attorney of record on a Supreme Court case. Uh, this came out of uh, North Carolina, uh, what's called the Graham County case. Uh, and the issue was, can a whistleblower in a company bring one of these cases and collect 30% if the whistleblower themselves don't have personal knowledge of the violation? They read, read it in a report, a public report. And uh, so the, uh, this was the, the case here. And uh, We Pharma, uh, well, We Pharma, at the time I was actually in a law firm, but I did this. But in, on behalf of Pharma, we argued, no, a whistleblower should not be allowed to bring a case which he has no knowledge of, she in this particular case. And uh, the U.S. government's position was, yes, they should be able to do this. They wanted to sort of expand the scope of the False Claims Act. Uh, my brief was accepted at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ultimately said, no, a whistleblower cannot do this if they don't have knowledge of the case themselves. And then, the, then Congress changed the law and said, yes, <laughs> they can do it after all. So that was one of the sort of interesting, uh, again, dilemmas that we faced. Okay, back to the industry just for a minute. One thing, is that, one thing that you may not uh, totally appreciate is the fact that you, the uh, consumer of pharmaceuticals here in the United States, subsidize the medicines around the world. Because the United States is one of the, is really the only market in the world that ha does not have government price controls over pharmaceuticals. When the Democrats took the House in 2006, they had, there were six agenda items that were put forth. And number one on the list was price controls on pharmaceuticals. And it didn't happen. 
Um, we could talk about that for a long time. Why it didn't happen? Part of the reason is because of pharma, where we were at the time, or was at the time, and the lobbying effort that was that was done there. But uh, the, the truth is that because the pharmaceutical companies are profitable here, that finances the R and D development of drugs that are sold around the world under price controls in some countries at a, at a loss uh, when it comes right down to it. So um, let's see, do I have time to talk about these cases? Uh, <clears throat> for example, I will talk about one case in Australia. This is a Bristol-Myers case. We had just, Bristol-Myers had just purchased Squibb and we learned um, that our cancer oncology product manager uh, in Australia was making, was falsely reporting the cost of the goods in Australia because the cost, the price of pharmaceuticals was determined by the government based on the cost of the goods and producing the goods. And he was submitting false reports on this in order to raise the price of the goods that would be reimbursed by the government. Well, I was sitting back in uh, New York City at the time, maybe Princeton, New Jersey, actually, because we'd already purchased Squibb where they were. And... Uh, uh, we had just had the merger, and we were planning this big retreat out in Colorado Springs or somewhere, this nice resort. This was back in the days when the companies had a lot of money. They don't do this anymore. I was very excited about this, and I got a call like the night before we were supposed to leave for this thing, and uh, my boss uh, said to me, hey, we just learned about this situation in Australia. You're on the plane tomorrow, and you go fix this. So I was on the plane the next day and went down there, and it took me uh, a week or so to... We, take, we took this in, we disclosed it to the government, we said, look, we're sorry about this, it was the act of one employee who did this, and uh, we negotiated with the government, we paid back everything that the company had made uh, out of this uh, misrepresentations of this particular employee, and um, it, was a, it was a really interesting uh, situation. Um, the employee himself, I went in a room and interviewed him about you know, trying to get the facts before we went and disclosed to the government, and I learned the next day that he, and he was from a different culture than we are. I, I, he was from Middle East, from the Middle East. And he thought we were going to kill him. And he had called, I think he was a, a Christian, and he had called his priest that night before to give him last rites because he really thought the company was going to kill him. Uh, we were very serious about the violations, but not that serious. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the Taxol case, Taxol is a, it's called Taxateer in the brand name. It's uh, uh, actually uh, uh, was the biggest leap forward in oncology drugs uh, in 10 years. Uh, it was discovered by, uh, by Bristol Myers and uh, approved in the United States. And we tried to take it to Japan. And uh, Japan was not going to approve this drug because it was going to add to the uh, government's uh, bill, you know, the, uh, the um, budget for pharmaceuticals in the government, and, and it was going to be expensive, uh, and, it was, uh, and they just didn't want to approve it because they didn't want to add this budget price amount to the uh, cost of health care in Japan in spite of the fact, and this was for treating uh, uh, women's cancer and uh, ovarian cancer, which was very tough to treat, and uh, this big leap forward, and they didn't want to approve this. So we launched a lobbying effort in Japan, uh, which is something kind of unheard of in Japan, really. And so we went through uh, women's patients groups to do this uh, lobbying effort in Japan uh, to finally get this drug approved so that they could have the benefit of this drug. Okay. Now, um, um, not only do we subsidize... Um, the rest of the world, but also uh, the third world sort of uh, borrows, if I can use that term, U.S. research. Uh, sometimes they call it pirating. This has been a problem in a lot of countries. It's been solved in many countries. China and India are our biggest problems uh, right now. Um, and uh, one of the cases that I got involved in was a case uh, in Korea. Uh, and I set the stage a little bit by saying in, uh, I don't know if there are any of you engineers or chemists or patent folks that are here, but in the pharmaceutical business there, in those days, there were basically two kinds of patents. One is you patent the molecule itself, which is what causes the action in the body that cures the disease. The other patent is you can patent the process for making the molecule itself. So uh, in Korea, we had a smallish business 
uh, that was based on one product, an antibiotic product, amicacin, had been discovered in Japan actually, but, uh, and it was the heart of our business. And then we uh, discovered that another, that a, the biggest Korean company was knocking off this product and making it uh, themselves. Uh, and in Korea at the time, there was only process patent law. You could not patent the compound. So they were just tweaking the process, making no difference whatsoever in the end compound or the active ingredient that actually did the healing. And so um, uh, we, we got our lawyers involved, and they prosecuted the case, and they came and they said, there's nothing we can do about this because they don't have the product patent law, the process patent law in Japan. There's nothing more we can do about this because they claim to have a process patent on this. Well, that meant the end of our business in Korea. Uh, you know, it wasn't good enough for me personally. So I, we sat down. I decided that what we should do on this, and it took some lobbying at the company to get them to approve this, was to go to Washington, go to the U.S. Trade Representative's office, and bring an Unfair Trade Practices Act against the government of Korea based on this patent law. Uh, and this launched a lobbying effort on my part to go down to the government and, and convince them to take this case. And, and not only took a lot of lobbying with the USTR's office itself to get them to take this case, but I had to go through every single department in the government that was involved in any way with Korea. Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, Department of the Treasury, Department of Labor, Department of Agriculture, and then on the Hill. We went up on the Hill. It took a year. We finally got it accepted. The USTR, uh, as soon as they accepted and filed the case, made big news in Korea and all in the press and uh, led to a pretty fast settlement uh, after that and ultimately led to the change of the Korea's patent law to institute a, a product patent. So it was one of my, it's one of my real um, accomplishments, if I can say it that way, that just sort of, you know, one guy sitting in the company and saying, no, this doesn't work, we've got to do something different. Uh, ultimately had the, the effect of changing the law in, uh, in Korea. All right. Um, I think I'll keep going here. Oh, I guess I should say that not only do foreign companies sort of steal our technology, but sometimes in America we steal each other's technology. <laughs> that happens too. And uh, one example of that is uh, you're probably all aware of the statin drugs. These are like Lipitor uh, is the biggest one that people know. Uh, the uh, they are the cholesterol-lowering drugs. And they were actually discovered in Japan by Sankyo, which uh, because, there's no, because there's price controls on pharmaceuticals in Japan, Sankyo was not making enough money to develop this drug and sell it worldwide, so they licensed it out to us, Bristol-Myers, so that we could develop it and, and license it and take it around the world and market it. Well, uh, Bristol-Myers, we did a lot of clinical trials on this product. We all knew that it lowered cholesterol. But the label didn't say that it prevents heart attacks. Everybody believed it did. If you lower cholesterol, it ought to prevent heart attacks. But we didn't have the evidence on that until Bristol Myers did the clinical trials and we got the evidence that not only did it lower cholesterol, it prevented heart attacks. And then once we had done that, then some other companies got, took our studies basically and said, and around the world, this didn't really happen in the United States because the FDA was too strict on this, but in other places in the world, they started saying, oh yeah, you know, our drug, uh, Simvastatin, uh, uh, Mevacor, it also prevents heart attacks. Well, they didn't have the studies themselves, and this was strictly not allowed in the United States, and actually wasn't allowed in most countries. So we went on to a, a, a project of uh, bringing cases against uh, these uh, competitors sort of on a global basis, was what I call the Statin Wars. And uh, so this is just an example of how sometimes these ethical things, you know, not only happen in foreign countries, but happen among ourselves. All right, what do we got here? Okay, getting off uh, maybe uh, drug uh, things directly here, let's talk a little bit about some of the other uh, ethical challenges. What have we got up here? Okay, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. I was the compliance officer at Bristol Myers for what's called the FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It's a U.S. legislation that says if you engage in bribery overseas, it's a criminal uh, violation. So that was one of the big ones. Uh, we never had a violation in the company during the time I was there, which I'm very satisfied to say. Uh, and uh, shortly after I left, they did have one. Maybe I should have caught it while I was there, but I don't know. But anyway, that was uh, to give you one example. Um, in China... Uh, 
all, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is aimed at bribing government officials. It's not private bribery. So, but in China, uh, we were uh, Bristol Myers had the Zimmer Company, which made orthopedic implants, false, uh, you know, artificial uh, knees, uh, <laughs> hips, so forth. And in China, in order to sell these artificial implants, orthopedic implants, uh, you really have to pay the doctors to do this. They're just not going to sell your product unless you pay them. And all the doctors in China are government employees. So we ran into this dilemma, and we have, all this stuff has to be reported. Any payments to government officials have to report, be reported under the FCPA to the United States Treasury. So we were getting this information. It's coming back saying, hey, our, you know, we're doing this uh, in, uh, in uh, China. Of course, everybody was doing it with all products. Otherwise, I mean, the Chinese doctors were just not going to sell your product unless you paid them to do so. And so um, we had a very big uh, orthopedic implant business in China. And long story short, I sat down with management. And, you know, I said to somebody earlier that it was no fun being a lawyer at Bristol-Myers because they... Uh, they, they never wanted to work in the gray area where lawyers like to work, you know, is this right or is it wrong or doable, not doable. They always would be so in, into the wide area of the law that it was not a lot of challenge for us lawyers. And this was one of those cases. I, in my view, I thought there's got to be a way we can figure this out and do this and make this work uh, by changing how we do business or something like that, you know. Uh, and the company just said, nope. We're not going to do it. And we shut down a multi-million dollar business in China, completely pulled out of China on that business because of that. So I was proud of the company uh, for taking that position. I obviously supported it, but often thought that, you know, we could maybe be a little more uh, creative and look for a way that this could maybe be done. All right. Um, I'm going to switch now uh, maybe off sort of this ethical uh, topic and uh, move into just some other cases, experiences, stories that I've had uh, working in international. Um, and I don't know, uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end, so if you want to come back to ethical things, we can come back to that in your, in your Q&A. Although if there's any burning questions on ethics, I'd be happy to take those right now. No ethical dilemmas. Good, we'll move on. All right. I just mentioned these. These are, let's see. Oh, let me add this. I threw this slide in. It's not on my... No, I just threw this in this morning, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is a slide that came from Steve Albrecht. Some of you might know Steve Albrecht. He is a professor at BYU, uh, was a missionary companion of mine. Uh, he is the premier accounting fraud, white-collar crime expert in the United States. He's testified in all the cases, from uh, starting from Enron to uh, you, know, you name it, they're, they're all there. Uh, and anyway, this is a slide that I borrowed from him. Uh, this is a survey that was done of college students uh, and the ethics of college students. I think you can see this and sort of reach your own conclusions without me going through it. But I think the point of this slide to me when I sort of saw this this morning was, you know, it's not the businessmen necessarily. I mean, this is not where it starts in business with making a profit. You know, this starts with you guys your, you know, your ethical values. And it probably starts before that. It starts with parents and how you're going to raise your children. But I think that ethics, it's not just sort of business ethics. I think it's ethics as a topic in general. And where are you and will you take this wherever you are into your business careers with you? So just a sort of a word of conclusion on there. You know, I think this shows a trend that we're moving we're moving from, you know, these years into these years, and the trend is not good uh, in this country. And I hope that uh, one of the things we'll come away from today is a commitment to, to reverse this trend in our own personal experiences. All right, moving on. Let's see. Okay, my other favorite cases. Um, one of the things I did in Japan uh, when I worked for the law firm was set up the very first MLM business. Anybody know what an MLM? Multi-level marketing business, okay? And uh, if, this is a huge industry now in Utah. It wasn't back in these days. It was like 1980, no, probably 1978 or something like this. And um, uh, there were, no, none of these companies were in Japan. There were, they had what they called pyramid marketing, which is pyramid marketing is different than multi-level marketing. Pyramid marketing 
was a scheme where if you recruit a distributor uh, and he, he, he has to pay you to join the business and you make money by recruiting distributors and they pay you a fee and you don't sell products. Multi-level marketing is you don't get paid. The distributors down your line don't get paid unless you sell products. And so there's a big difference between those two, but we had pyramid marketing in Japan. The government was very upset about this. And so when Amway came to Japan and tried to set up multi-level marketing, this was a really difficult, huge deal with the Japanese government. government. But we finally got them approved, and then Forever Living Products came in, uh, uh, which I also did, which is an Arizona company, us, which was... Uh, from some folks we knew there, um, and then, you know, New Skin. And this is, Japan is New Skin's biggest market. In fact, multi-level marketing in Japan is probably bigger than it is in the United States. It's become this huge uh, MLM market. And uh, that was one of the very, we set up the very first uh, uh, MLM company in Japan in the form of Amway. They made, I should have taken stock instead of legal fees. I would, we wouldn't be having this conversation today probably if I'd done that. It'd be in Hawaii or somewhere else, but, uh, okay. Uh, handle the case. Steve McQueen, does anybody know here Steve McQueen besides us old folks? <laughs> they were very famous in his day. Uh, Steve McQueen, uh, uh, there was a movie, The Great Escape. If you haven't seen Steve McQueen's The Great Escape, it's a classic, you have to go see it. But a movie company and National Panasonic in Japan took some footage out of The Great Escape and made advertising materials without Steve's permission. And so when McQueen found out about this, brought an action for, uh, you know, inappropriate, unauthorized use of his materials. Uh, I mean, this is sort of a no-brainer for us in the United States, but they didn't have this concept in Japan at the time. So we made up the concept that this was a, a violation of like to one's right, a right to one's own likeness, that you cannot take a person's, a famous person's likeness, photos, movie clips in this case, and use them for commercial purposes. And they didn't have this concept in Japan. This litigation went on for about 10 years. I had the chance to meet S Steve McQueen in the office once. He's shorter than I am. He's about 5'6", which you'd never believe. You'll see the movie. But anyway, uh, went on, went on, went on. And, uh, and uh, S Steve McQueen finally passed away. And the month after he passed away, the court finally handed down a decision in his favor with $100 damages. So... <laughs> We sued for a million, asked for a million, but we got $100, but we established the principle. So, okay, we did some work for the Osmonds and their trademarks. Gary Carter, who you would not remember, was a famous pitcher for the uh, New York Mets and then went to, to Canada. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun because, you know, jockeys and rock stores who had had drug violations in Japan. It was, it was very interesting, some experiences there. Okay, culture and business. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's... Uh, the cultural aspects of doing business abroad are, are very ex interesting. Sometimes they're challenging. I use, a, you know, do you bow or do you scrape? You know, what's the right thing to do uh, in the culture? Uh, clearly, uh, knowing the culture uh, helps in a country. Uh, it's, uh, if you don't, uh, not knowing can sometimes hurt. I had this experience a uh, year before last. Uh, we were, uh, while I was uh, doing public affairs, we were in the Osaka mayor's office. Uh, Osaka is the second largest uh, city in uh, Japan, about 6 million people. We're in the mayor's office. I mean, it takes a lot to get into the mayor's office, especially in Japan where, you know, we're a church. We want to go sit down with the mayor. They're not, they don't, I'll talk about this a little bit later. They don't really uh, like to sit and talk to, to religions. I think I talk about this later. I, but anyway, we got there. And uh, we uh, were making a presentation. We were discussing education and what the church is doing for educating young people around the world. And uh, talking to the mayor about what they're doing in, in Osaka and so forth. And one of the members of our delegation who'd come over from the United States had a little pamphlet that talked about what we were doing for education. Big, long conference table. And he's sort of sitting down towards the end of the conference table a little bit and said, uh, you know, Mr. Mayor, we have this pamphlet. And he threw it and slid it way down this big conference table across to the mayor. And we're all just sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness. You know, it was such an enormous faux pas. And we spent quite a lot of time afterwards, you know, privately apologizing to the mayor for this. I mean, this would have been rude in the United States, basically. But in Japan, it was just completely, I mean, in Japan, it's, you know, if you give somebody something, it's, you know, one of these things. And so anyway, uh, 
my rule of thumb basically has been what I say up here, and that is if you don't know the culture, then you know, do what's polite in American culture, and uh, you'll probably be okay. Let me just talk a little bit about the uh, Tokyo Temple case, because I think that illustrates uh, some of these other uh, points here. Um, in uh, uh, 1975, uh, the church uh, announced the building of a, a temple in Tokyo, first one in Asia. And uh, I was there in the law firm, and uh, we had some problems. As pretty common, you build a large building, and the neighbors don't like it, and they didn't like this one, and they formed a group and came after us. Uh, and the basis for this, and this is a cultural thing, was uh, that the building of this temple, which is a fairly large building in a very nice neighborhood, and these folks have seen it, um, across the street from a park, was going to cast a shadow on the neighbor's and take away their right to sunlight. Now in Tokyo, this is a big deal because it's a t 13 million people, 33 million people in the greater Tokyo area, a lot of people, and having sunlight on your, in your windows is a, is a big thing. And so the neighbors came together and, uh, and uh, threatened to uh, bring a case uh, against us in the, in the, uh, for this. And uh, make a long story short, this went on for about a year, completely stopped the construction for about a year. Um, I was there in the law firm at the time, uh, and uh, Adney Komatsu, who had been my mission president and was then the area president, called me and said, hey, can you do anything with this? And so we worked on this for a period of a year, and uh, the neighbors were an interesting group of neighbors. It was a very wealthy part of, of Tokyo where we bought this land right after World War II, and it was a bombed-out old house. And, uh, but it had become a very, uh, you know, sort of ritzy embassy district and we had a, one of the, a movie star was a neighbor. We had a big construction company that was a neighbor. And there was a, a piece of property that had six Mongolian families squatting on it because they had, had been, uh, these guys had been so foreign exchange students uh, in Japan during the war. And when, you know, China took over Inner Mongolia during the war, they just decided not to go back. And so they squatted and had little tiny hats on this land. And they were part of this group that are opposing us because we were going to cast a shadow on their little hats. So... Um, one summer, during the summer, when this thing was uh, going on, uh, we were, could not settle this dispute. Uh, it was just going on and on. And uh, we, uh, one summer, we had a professor from BYU uh, named Paul Heyer show up in Tokyo. Probably the only, I'm sure, the only man in the church at that time who spoke Mongolian. And we took him over to speak to these Mongolian neighbors, explained who we were, what we were, what we were trying to do there, and uh, the other guys would not settle, would not settle, and we had offered a monetary settlement that we felt, based on the legal cases, was fair for per hour violation of taking away your sunlight. Sunlight actually had a price on it, based on the cases. We had offered this, but the uh, rich guys didn't want to settle for this. But anyway, this guy who speaks Mongolian shows up, sits down with these Mongolian neighbors, and is able to speak to them in their own language, and they settled out. So that's just a little example of what a culture, language aspect of sort of doing business in a place uh, uh, can, can help. Um, took a lot of patience. Uh, at the end of the day, I took a lot of good faith, I think, on our part. We never, from the day we made the offer to the day we, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't say settle this case because what happened at the end of the day is that they uh, basically said, we're going to sue you uh, because they wouldn't accept the settlement offer they had made and we and the, I remember this guy, lawyer, pounding on the desk, which never happens in Japan, really, saying, you know, you leave us no choice but to sue you. And we said, okay. And uh, so we brought in the trucks and tore down the old mission home and started to build a temple. And every day I'm holding my breath. Are they, when are they going to sue us? When are they going to sue us? And, you know, they never did sue us. And uh, because I think they knew that we had made a fair offer and it was going to be a huge loss of face for them to go into court and the judge says, well, how much you, have you offered these people? And we say, well, this is what we offer. And the judge says, well, that's fair. So they weren't going to do that. So anyway, that was learned a lot of cultural as well as legal lessons from this uh, particular case. All right. Uh, public affairs. Um, this is sort of switching to the experience we had in Japan uh, starting in 2010. Uh, uh, Brett, where are you? You're here in the class somewhere. Okay, Brett's right there. Um, I came home from uh, Washington, D.C. after being in the pharmaceutical industry over there and 
so we came back to Utah after been, being gone for like 35 years uh, from Utah. We built a house uh, down in Draper. I'm down there trying to start my own practice, minding my own business. And Brett's dad called up from Japan. He was the area president in Japan and said, hey, would you come over here and do public affairs for us? I gave him a long list of reasons why I couldn't do it, why this was not a good time. Um, <clears throat> um, but basically said, you know, but if you call us to come, we'll come. So he said, let me think about it. Four days later, he, he called us up and said, we'd like you to come. So I said, well, my private practice isn't doing so well anyway, so I'll go. <laughs> so <laughs> I <clears throat> figured that it was, uh, you know, just starting out. I hadn't invested that much in it at this point. So we went. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, and uh, uh, just trying to see if I can capsulize this just a little bit here. Um, you know, I'd had a little experience back in New York City working with the United Nations for the church in trying to work with the United Nations ambassadors in, in countries where uh, the church was not yet accepted. Uh, so that was a little experience I'd had. But when we went to Japan, the key job there was to try and build bridges from a public affairs point of view. Uh, and the big challenge was in Japan, there's this enormous separation of, uh, of church and state where the and I'll just give you one example. When the church built its temple down in Fukuoka, second temple in Japan, we had the U.S. ambassador, Tom Foley, been speaker, uh, I think the majority, he'd been the Senate majority leader, very well-known politician. He was the U.S. ambassador. Uh, our public affairs guy at the time was um, Norm Shumway, who had been a U.S. congressman, obviously knew uh, the ambassador. He invited him to come down to a VIP reception for us down in Fukuoka, he came down, we invited all the government officials in, the, in that area down there uh, to come, and, and nobody came. Not one of them showed up because the Japanese government just does not want to deal with religions. There's just such a strict separation of church and state. And part of that is because uh, of this thing right here, the sudden gas attack, 1995, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, religious uh, cult in Japan uh, that's what they call us sometimes, I think, wasn't it? But anyway, they had this subway gas attack that killed a whole bunch of people. And since that time, I mean, it's just hands off for religion. So uh, and if you watch the press, sometimes the, the uh, prime minister of Japan will go to the Yasukuni Shrine where the war dead are, and everybody gets so upset about this. Anyway, so we had this, uh, when we went to Sapporo, uh, year before last, to do the groundbreaking for the Sapporo Temple. Ten years later, uh, we had a former prime minister and a whole bunch of other government people come. And the reason, came, well, the reason for that was probably because of what we're going to talk about uh, next, and that was the um, humanitarian effort that uh, we had put in in Japan. So this is a picture of me there. Uh, we, when we got to Japan, after Brett's dad asked us to come to Japan, uh, <clears throat> And I think was mentioned earlier, uh, my wife and I had been in, in Sendai 10 years earlier when I was the mission president there. And uh, so um, we go back, we're in Tokyo, been in Tokyo a few months, and this earthquake happens in, in Sendai. So um, don't think it was a coincidence, but it was a wonderful experience for us to, to be back there. And this is a, an unbelievable experience in a lot of ways. I'm just going to try and sort of walk through this. This gives you sort of a feel for sort of the immensity of this, of this tragedy. I think this, whoops, this one alone right here sort of tells the experience. And of course, close to 20,000 people died in this. Um, not nearly uh, the extent of deaths that happened in Indonesia with their tsunami, but I think this is the largest single uh, monetary, the size of the monetary loss, uh, because it completely wiped out all the infrastructure in 92 you know, the railroads, the, town, the, the buildings, everything was gone uh, with, if it was within a, a mile or two of the coastline there. So anyway, let's see what we got here. Okay, these are just some pictures of, uh, of this situation that just give you a feel for uh, what happened there, and we can just talk a little bit about this. Uh, as you saw there, I think 450,000 cars destroyed, a little car on a building there. This is a railroad car. I mean, this is, railroad cars are heavier than cars. <laughs> they're heavier than buses. They're heavier than boats. 
This is an enormous railroad car. You can see that this is, this is down in the valley. This is at least 100 feet above sea level. It's about a mile inland from the sea, and the tsunami took this railroad car and dropped it right on the top of this mountain on top of this cemetery. This, to me, I mean, it's just incomprehensible, the power of water. Uh, it was coming in somewhere between, when it hit the shore, it was normally somewhere between 10 and 30 feet high wave. Um, but as it went up these canyons, you kind of see that this is in a, there's a canyon here. As it came up the canyon, it was going up to 120 feet wall of water. And it just took everything in its path and just washed it right up, including this railroad car. So, okay. Whoops, am I going the wrong way? There we go. Uh, that's my wife and I doing. We got really involved in the humanitarian uh, effort. Um, we could talk about this. I'm very passionate about this. We could talk for, about this for a long, long time. Uh, this is a refugee evacuation center. What it looked like uh, right after the tsunami when people had lost their homes, they were going into, this is a gymnasium, um, and this is how they're living. And we went in, the first gymnasium we went into, they had 350 people in, originally, and, and down when we got there, the 250 people that were just living like this on the floor, and they lived like this for two, three, four months. They eventually went into these, uh, uh, these uh, temporary housing units are built by the government. This is basically prefab housing, and this is the size of these units. This is for one man. Sometimes there are families of four living in these little places. Uh, the church put a lot of effort into its humanitarian effort. This is a, a cleanup job of a, of a Shinto shrine that uh, we did. Uh, this is a group of missionaries, actually, that did this one. Uh, this is Steve Albrecht, I think, right? Whoops. That's, that's Brett's dad. That's Elder Stevenson, who's from Logan, uh, Utah State graduate and honored graduate here recently. But uh, this project at the Shinto Shrine that we did uh, led to uh, us being invited by Meiji Shrine down in Tokyo, which is like the sort of the... I mean, Shinto is a very... It doesn't have a centralized... Um, you know, organization, like you might imagine with the Catholic Church or with us. Shinto is very split, and so is Buddhism, actually. But I liken it to our invitation to go to the Meiji Shrine in Tokyo was like being invited to the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and they asked us to talk about our humanitarian aid effort throughout the world. Because these guys at Meiji Shrine said, you know, you went up and helped us clean up this shrine up here, we didn't even go up to clean up these shrines. We don't, we don't do this. This is not something that they would do. And they were just really sort of overwhelmed with the fact that we would send this group of people up to help them clean up when they didn't even do it for themselves. So this led, from a public affairs perspective, as a great opportunity for us. So this is some of our guys with their helping hands vests on, showing just a little bit of what was involved in the early days, shoveling mud. I mean, the muck and the mud was just sort of unbelievable. The smell was incredible. Uh, making hygiene kits. This is a project Cindy and I went on. Um, this was one of our er early trips up there. I made 17 trips up into the area, but we were working on shoveling out this lady's house. Let's see, this lady here. Uh, her daughter came by uh, who lived in a separate place. I said, how are you doing? How's your family? She says, oh, my family was fine. She says, but we lost my brother and his two children. And she said, but. She said, the good news was we found their bodies. And you saw before, there's like 4,000 people missing that were never found. And I didn't realize how important it was to be able to find the body, you know, and uh, it gave me a big appreciation for how that brings closure. But she says, we found the body of my brother and the two children, and when we found them, they were holding on to each other. So we knew that they had died together. And uh, that was really uh, a great comfort to her. So... Um, I think this is the last uh, slide I have, and we'll move into a little video that I brought here. This is a picture of Taylor Anderson, and you may have heard this story on CNN. This was national news. Uh, Taylor is an American uh, young woman from uh, uh, the Virginia area who is over in Japan, Ishinomaki, uh, teaching English, a uh, JET teacher, Japan English teacher for, for the Japanese government. And uh, after the tsunami, he was missing. And uh, 
we, uh, I got a call. This was like two second day after the tsunami. And I got a call from our Washington, D.C. public affairs office from a woman I knew there pretty well. And she said, I have a friend who has a friend whose daughter is missing in Ishinomaki. They can't find her. And this woman was not a member of the church, but she said, she said, I know you have missionaries all over Japan. Is there anything you can do to help look for my daughter? And so I got this call from Washington, D.C. Uh, by this time, we'd evacuated a lot of our missionaries out of the area. We had two uh, sister y- young women who were in Ishinomaki. Uh, they'd been the last ones we'd been able to find. It took us five days to get them out. But uh, basically, and it was so... Th- we could talk about this for a long time, but if you want to talk about emergency preparedness, and if I asked you what's the number one big problem you'd think about emergency preparedness, most of you probably wouldn't say this, but it's gasoline. Being able to get in cars, gasoline for cars, because the gas stations were all wiped out and the, there's no trucks bringing gasoline in. So we couldn't get in. That was the big problem. But I called our welfare manager who had been able to get up there, and I said, you know, this is a situation with this Taylor Anderson. Because uh, there's anything you can do about it. Well, long story short, you know, we had no success uh, with that. But I got up on day 10 after the tsunami and uh, went up. Uh, Elder Stevenson, Gary Stevenson called and says, you have to come up. I was doing public affairs. He says, you have to come up and document this. So we went up. Public affairs soon changed to emergency relief and humanitarian relief. We didn't do so much public affairs, but... Uh, we went up, <clears throat> we found a hotel that was open, had no hot water, but it did have electricity. I was staying in this hotel, went there for about four days, and I was checking out. I was standing at the checkout counter at this uh, hotel, getting ready to leave, and there was uh, another tall American who was standing there checking out, and uh, there was a bunch of camera equipment stuff around, so I thought maybe he was there as a reporter uh, trying to report on this disaster, and uh, so I said to him, I said, what brings you over here? Are you uh, doing reporting on this? He said, no. He said, uh, we came over to uh, bring Taylor's body home. So for me, that was pretty impactful and a pretty emotional experience. Uh, when you take uh, a disaster of this magnitude and bring it down to an individual level to see you know, what was going on over there uh, was, was pretty powerful in a lot of ways. But it was a great opportunity for us. Took our international career, uh, being a lawyer all those years, and then took it into uh, basically a volunteer uh, assignment and uh, uh, being able to have an experience like this. So there's a lot of things that an international career can lead to, and I think we'll close off here. I have a couple of a little short video I think we'll show you, uh, and then we'll take any questions that you might have. There you are, the video guy. Almost 100 days ago, Japan shook under the force of its most powerful earthquake ever recorded. A devastating tsunami followed, and for people along a 300-mile stretch of coastline, life is still far from normal. KSL 5 News anchor Bruce Lindsay talked with them and has their amazing stories. He traveled to Japan this week and has this exclusive journey into Japan. What we've seen here is a vivid reminder of just how short the attention span of the news cycle is. Japan's suffering made headlines in the United States for two or three weeks, and then the spotlight quickly moved on to other things. Remember these pictures from March that showed a fishing village drowned. This is Kesanuma today. Yoshiki Yumiko was in her house when the ground shook and when the sirens began to blare. Yumiko-san struggled to make her way up the hill to higher ground. She has not gone back. She says she has no idea where her house is. It was washed away. If I went back, she says, I wouldn't know where to find it. As overpowering as the sight of Kesanuma's wreckage is Kesanuma's smell, a smell of sludge, even a smell of death. In other cities on the coast, Ishinomaki and Higashi Matsushima, the devastation is beyond belief. 
These are the casualty numbers today from the quake and mostly the tsunami. More than a half million homes damaged or destroyed. 91,000 people still living in evacuation centers. More than 15,000 people confirmed dead, plus another 8,000 still missing. Count little Haruno Koizumi lucky, even though she is still living in a tent in an evacuation center. She says the house was washed away. Some of it was okay, the second floor, but the rest of it was washed away. It's down close in the rubble where the tsunami really gets personal. A notebook, a tube of toothpaste, a dress on a hanger, a shoe on the ground. Remnants of people's lives, people who lived here, people who died. And then the intrusion so out of place like ships in the middle of where an upscale neighborhood used to be. The life of these coastal cities and villages used to be the fishing fleets that brought in the daily catch. Their plight has become the focus of a humanitarian outreach of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This week, a top official of the church is scheduled to make a presentation to a group of fishermen here to enable them to return to their livelihood at sea. We'll be there for that ceremony and bring you the story tomorrow. Dini? All right, Bruce, see you tomorrow. <laughs> People in Japan yelled to workers, hurry, run, from powerful waters during Japan's tsunami in March. This video released today came from a family that lived on a hill overlooking a wharf. Residents want the city's fishing fleet to recover. And now the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has expanded its relief efforts for victims of Japan's earthquake and tsunami this week with a humanitarian donation to a fisherman's cooperative. In tonight's Journey into Japan, Bruce Lindsay reports exclusively from coastal cities. The view from the minivans that rolled through the rubble of cities that once were left even a veteran observer of natural disasters unable to find a comparison. Have you ever seen anything like this? Never. Nothing, nothing compares with the degree of devastation and the width and the breadth of it. 300 miles. The tsunami devastated the coastal fishing industry in this part of Japan, and just repairing the boats is not enough. That's what led to the presentation this week from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you want to go out in the ocean, we don't have that ice. Mr. Kikuchi says we need ice. He heads the fishermen's cooperative in Watari. The tsunami tossed their boats inland, shattered their warehouses, destroyed their docks and fouled their nets. The men with weathered faces are working on repairs, but they had no hope of affording a replacement for an expensive refrigeration unit that makes ice. Yes, the livelihood of more than 200 families depends upon ice to preserve the catch. Our gift consists of a three and a half ton ice maker, five Subo refrigerator, a cooler truck, and other equipment and supplies to be decided in the future. We hope in some small way this will assist you. We wish you well. In Japan, religious organizations are not in the mainstream of society, and churches can find it difficult to extend even gifts with no strings attached. Latter-day Saint leaders hope the successful negotiation of this gift will be a breakthrough that will lead to expansion of the church's humanitarian efforts for victims of Japan's disasters. Education, employment initiatives, uh, agricultural initiative, uh, fishing initiative are uh, three of the areas that uh, kind of go along with all of the volunteer uh, efforts that are being made. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't be happier uh, with the support that we felt uh, from home, both monetary support and the prayers that have been offered on behalf of the people in Japan. This comes from the two and three and four and five dollar donations we receive on Sundays from, from members around the world. Uh, as part of that humanitarian fund that allows us to represent the church in these kinds of endeavors. I wish that they could be here and experience the joy that comes into the eyes of these individuals whose uh, future didn't seem bright. And now we've lightened their load just a little bit. The gift of an industrial ice maker is compatible with the church's principle of self-reliance. These are, after all, not men who need to be taught how to fish. Bruce Lindsay, KSL 5 News, Watari, Japan. We'll have more exclusive stories and video from Bruce's journey into Japan in the coming days on KSL 5 News. Okay, that's Four it. Four months, sir. Uh... That is just uh, wonderful. We have about 10 minutes that we can use for questions. So if anybody has some questions,
on any either the career in in uh, pharmaceutical industry or the experience in Japan. Or anything else. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for your help on this today. I appreciate that. Uh, yes. I have a question. Uh, I imagine with pharmaceuticals, there's a trade-off between um, bringing, you know, making a drug safe and then bringing a potentially life-saving drug or life-enhancing drug to the market. How do you, uh, how do you measure that trade-off? Wow. How much time do you have? <laughs> That's, it's a really good question. And... Uh, you know, it's just, uh, the, the drugs are so expensive. I don't know if I said this in the lecture, but it takes about $1.2 billion now, these days, to get a drug on the market. And uh, out of every 5,000 compounds studied, uh, you know, uh, one will make it into clinical trials. Out of the f five drugs in clinical trials, uh, one will make it into the market. So it's enormously expensive to do this, and it's because the United States has such a gold standard for making drugs. Both There's two re requirements, safe and effective, and those are the things. Like it costs a lot of money. The industry works very hard to make them both safe and effective. It's very expensive. It's a huge issue. Pharmaceuticals are very expensive in this country, and we all realize that. I just came back from the East Coast where I have an uncle and an aunt. He's got... Uh, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, and his treatment was uh, $15,000 a month, his pharmaceuticals, $15,000 a month. And he finally got some help with that, reduced down to, so last year he paid $70,000 for pharmaceutical products. That is not a happy story. And that's one, as a representative of the pharmaceutical industry for many years, it's not a, it's not a story that's easy to defend. I don't know if that answers your question, but this trade-off between safe, effective, and price tough, tough, tough issue. But thanks to you all, you're helping to pay for these, discover these drugs which are blessing people's lives around the world. What about the issue of bringing in drugs from, I know I've heard of people who have brought drugs in from Canada. Are they the same quality? Is it the same thing? What is that issue about? Uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Depends on where they're coming from and, and you know, what they are. Uh, big issue when I was at Pharma is a very big issue. Importation of unlicensed uh, drugs, basically. And some of them are fine. They come in from countries that maybe have good manufacturing standards. You can buy drugs from Canada, very low price. But if they're not approved in the United States, uh, you know, that are, that, or, or the manufacturing hasn't been surveyed by the FDA, uh, you can get some pretty bad stuff. And uh, you know, I could tell you some horror stories about the kind of drugs that come in that are made in Pakistan uh, and places that are just where the standards are just not there. Uh, drugs that are made using completely chemicals that have no, act no active ingredients whatsoever. They're just fake pills. And that's your risk. That's your risk. If you buy them, you know, over the Internet from Canada or some other source, you just run a risk. Uh, some of them are fine. Some of them are not. So that's, you just, it's, that's, you, you, if you really want to be safe, then you go to your pharmacist here. But, and some of them are fine, but you just, you don't always know. The FDA checks these and approves them, but it's hard to know whether you're getting those FDA approved drugs if you're buying them off the internet. Okay? Way in the back. Is there any way that the pharmaceutical industry is going to be affected by the Affordable Health Care Act? By the new Health Care Act, the Ob Obamacare, as it's called? Uh, yes, yes, definitely, that will be affected. Uh, the op official stance of the uh, pharmaceutical industry is to support, to, to be in support of the Health Care Act. And uh, they, they had did a lot of difficult lobbying in the, in the course of that. At the end of the day, uh, there were some, some trade-offs. There were some trade-offs on price. Uh, the industry uh, offered the government, Medicare, uh, huge discounts in order to, uh, to have no price controls. That was the big trade-off. Uh, they, you know, the government just, the industry just does not want the government to say, this is how much you charge for this drug. And so in order to keep that from happening, the industry offered a very big uh, discounts to Medicare, Medicaid, and other government programs. So that was basically uh, the big trade-off there and the big impact on the industry. Good question. Let me uh, take the floor to ask the last question. Uh, when the pharmaceutical uh, uh, 
uh, drug benefit, the benefit package was passed recently. There was a lot of conversation about how expensive that was going to be and, and, and uh, the extent to which that might exacerbate the deficit and so forth. But as you did your analysis on that uh, pharmaceutical benefit uh, package, uh, did you find actually that uh, the pharmaceuticals net net lowered uh, health care costs in America or was there a net uh, increase in cost to that benefit package? For the government, on the government's uh, part? For the government. Right. Well, it costs the government money. I think you're referring to the Part D, Medicare yes. Part D, Senior Citizen right. Drug Benefit, right. which I am very much grateful for today <laughs> as a senior citizen. <laughs> Last year, you know, this Medicare starts to look pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, yes, this, is, uh, this was passed, uh, passed in, in uh, 2005, went into effect 2006. Uh, basically, this was a big lobbying effort on the part of Farm. I walked in few days after it went into effect. And uh, the, the you know, industry really pushed hard to get this benefit for senior citizens. It cost the government a lot of money for this, for this benefit. Uh, the, the industry uh, lowered prices. It's very competitive. Uh, and the insurance companies provide the benefit. They negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, pharmaceutical sales went up. Good thing. Prices went down. Bad thing, but overall good for the companies cost the government money. This is going to be an ongoing discussion as we look at, you know, fiscal cliff, budgets, you know, ceilings, and all these kinds of things. This is going to go on for a long, long time. How about in terms of the cost savings associated with uh, hospitalizations, if you can do it with drugs rather than putting people in, in the hospital and giving them surgeries? Let me give you this example, if I can. Um, Japan, where I know a lot about, everybody basically has free pharmaceuticals basically, under their healthcare system, very small copay. And uh, the Japanese population consumes uh, multiple times the amount of pharmaceuticals that we do because the government pays for it, and, and doctors make money by, by dispensing pharmaceuticals. They don't, you don't go to a pharmacy, you go to your doctor, he gives you the drugs, and he gets a profit out of doing that. Uh, so the Japanese take many more pharmaceuticals than we do. Not necessarily a good thing, but their longevity and health is far surpasses ours. And, we, you know, and this is, could be a long argument, but the, just to make a little point, I think the fact that they have basically free access to pharmaceuticals uh, makes them a very healthy population. And this is not all, it's not the only reason. There are a lot of factors that go into that, but we believe that the fact that they have good access to pharmaceutical products and the end of the day keeps them healthy. And, and were it not for the fact the government pays for all health care there, uh, would save a lot of money in the system because they're so preventatively they're so healthy. Thank you I don't so know if that answers the question. You, why don't you join me in? Thank you. Thank you.